It gives me great pleasure to introduce Professor Larissa Berent, who is facilitating this morning's panel session, Bring Them Home, Securing the Rights of Our Children. Professor Berent is a Gamilaroi woman who holds the Chair of Indigenous Research at the Jambana Indigenous House of Learning at the University of Technology, Sydney. She's a graduate of the University of New South Wales and Harvard Law School and has published numerous textbooks on Indigenous legal and, legal and rights issues. Larissa won the two, 2002 David Unipon Award and the 2005 Commonwealth Writers' Prize for her novel, Home. Her second novel, Legacy, won a Victorian Premier's Literary Award and her most recent book is Finding Eliza, Power and Colonial Storytelling 2016. Larissa was awarded the 2009 NAIDOC Person of the Year Award and the 2011 New South Wales Australian of the Year. She is the host of Speaking Out on the ABC local radio and national television. So please everybody welcome Larissa Berent to the stage. bring the panellists up as well. Oh, I have nothing to facilitate. What do you do? Bringing oh, the panellists up. I know, up. <laughs> I know. That's your, that's your so, job. Okay. You're introducing them and you're Am really I? Well, can I just up. ask um, then uh, Professor Mick Dodson, Jim Morrison and Richard Weston to come to the stage then. <laughs> we might just sit over here for a bit of a chat. Well, I'm very honoured to be facilitating uh, this discussion this morning here on Ngunnawal Country and I'd like to pay my deep respects to them as the custodians and the knowledge holders of this land and extend that respect to their elders past and present. And I'd also like to acknowledge uh, with respect the many nations represented in the room here today, a really wonderful reminder of the rich diversity of our Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander cultures. And just a reminder that this session is being recorded for ABC Radio. Well, 20 years ago, the Bringing Them Home report by the National Inquiry into the separation of Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander children from their families was released. And a large part of the lasting power of that report were the very personal accounts it contained from the many people who gave evidence of their experiences either as members of the Stolen Generations or as members of the families whose children had been removed from them. Before that report, many Australians claimed to not know about this widespread, multi-generational policy of removing Indigenous children, even though it's hard to find a single Indigenous family not affected by the practice. The inquiry and its findings remain one of the most important documents about the child removal policy and an important roadmap for the way forward. So to discuss the impact of that report, the current issues facing members of the Stolen Generations and what actions need to take place, we have a distinguished group of leaders from the Indigenous community, each of whom have made a significant contribution to this important area. Our panellists this evening are Professor Mick Dodson, National Centre for Indigenous Studies at the Australian National University and Professor of Law at the Australian National University College of Law. Jim Morrison, co-chair of West Australian Stolen Generations Aboriginal Corporation. And Richard Weston, CEO of the Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander Healing Foundation. Please welcome them to the stage. Well, my first question to each of, each of you really is, given your roles working in the area today, and and also your perspectives as Indigenous people. I just wanted you to tell us what the Bringing Them Home report means to you now, 20 years on, from that personal perspective. And given your role on the in the original inquiry, Professor Dodson, it seems fitting to ask you about that first. Yes, good morning um, to everybody. Um, and also I'd like to once again uh, acknowledge the traditional owners and pay my respects to their elders. 
um, I s really sort of said everything I wanted to say yesterday. Um, but what lingers, I think, that uh, a sort of eternal disappointment is the lack of full implementation um, of the recommendations. Um, and I use the word full because I don't think you can point to any single recommendation that's been fully implemented. Um, some have been partially, some have been a sort of... Well, I have um, received some lip service, if you like. Um, but the gravity of the findings were demanded action. Action hasn't been taken. Now, what the commissioners found was this was a gross violation of human rights. Forcibly removing children from one group of people to another um, is considered genocide. Um, you don't have to kill people to commit genocide. But if you take kids away uh, from their culture with the intention of destroying that culture, um, that's genocide. And that was clearly provable during the course of the inquiry. Now, many people disagreed with that, um, including me. <laughs> um, I had to be persuaded by the other commissioners. Um, and it was a big, uh, a big finding to make. Um, but what led from that was uh, a formula that's set by the uh, United Nations human rights regimes about how you respond to gross violations of human rights. And I listed those five points yesterday in my, my address. Um, none of those have been fully satisfied. Um, the, and, and, you know, they're, they're called the Van Boven principles and they're based on um, long experience and development of human rights jurisprudence internationally. Um, and I think failing to properly respond to uh, those recommendations about how you address gross violations of human rights has been the, the gravest fault, I think, of, of uh, governments response uh, to the Bringing Them Home report. And Jim, from your perspective, working with stolen generations groups today, what does the Bringing Them Home report 20 years on mean to you? Larissa, can I firstly start off by acknowledging the survivors in the room of the stolen generation? Can you put your hand up if you're a survivor of the from stolen generations, please? I want to acknowledge the survivors for their resilience, strength, and it's an honour to be working with you. Um, it's one of the sad realities that um, too many of our survivors uh, are no longer with us, and um, so the, the strength of survivors uh, plays a big role in, in how I work, um, and I acknowledge my 30 parents uh, who were taken and what I call uh, put into concentration camps at varying stages, Dad, the oldest of 23, and Mum, one of seven, were put into these dreadful places. To me, the Bringing Them Home report just hasn't fulfilled uh, the obligations of our friend Mick here, and thank you, Mick, for the words you spoke yesterday. It was an honour to hear those words, and I feel um, gratified, but also very disappointed in the, in the lack of response from our government in, in implementing the recommendations. Um, equally, disappointed with the apology um, in 2009 as to what that meant to our people. It just really opened up a lot of wounds and, and trauma for us and uh, really quite a hollow gesture on behalf of the government. So I, I just think it, it we haven't done enough. There hasn't been um, any practical way of monitor what government are doing. In 2010, there was a stolen generations uh, ship Stolen Generation Partnership of um, important stakeholders in Canberra who came together every six months 
to talk about the, the bringing them home. Sadly, I think they only met, they were supposed to meet once every six months. I think they met three times uh, with the previous government. And so to me, it's just been um, a sad reflection on our society. Uh, I mean, the recommendations as far as I'm concerned are summarised with truth, justice and healing. And if you look at the truth aspects of that as far as education, uh, well, there's a very poor response from our schools as far as um, educating the broader community on issues facing the oldest living culture on the planet and certainly very little associated with the dreadful removal process. So I just think a, a lot of work needs to be done. It hasn't been done and again I would honour uh, Brother Mick here for the work he's done and, and uh, those commissioners. I would also like to honour a very dear friend of uh, um, Rob Riley who was very much part of that dreadful uh, period and um, yeah, it, there's a lot of uh, people that have gone before us now that have done so much work in this area that, and we really need to acknowledge them and those that have gone before us. And what about you, Richard? Obviously working in this space, it's provided a framework, but it still has a lot of resonance. What does the report mean to you 20 years on? Well, I think, um, I think, um, I think firstly, the, what the report did provide um, was a practical framework for addressing trauma and um, and creating the hope and optimism that perhaps we might get a national approach to healing that trauma. Um, and you know we, we've just heard that 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 hasn't hasn't happened um, to the degree that it, it 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 should have. But I think what still resonates for me is the depth and the breadth of those policies of removal through the 20th century. Uh, I don't think we have grasped the nettle around the impact of intergenerational trauma and trauma that is being played out in our communities today. Um, and I think that we've, the responses we get to dealing with issues like stolen generations and a range of other matters just don't go to the breadth and the depth of of the hurt and pain and disruption that's been caused to our cultures and our, our value systems and beliefs. So we've had um, many, many processes through the last couple of hundred years and the fortunate thing about the BDH report, it, it focused, it was able to focus on one aspect of that, that history. Um, so w we still continue to fall short in implementation and, and delivery around um, the Bring Them Home report, but other reports as well. Um, I, I guess if I could try and think about, in an optimistic way, about how we might might go forward. Let's let's not um, kid ourselves. This we're 20 years down the track. As Jim said, we've lost a lot of people, and I, I'd also like to pay my respects to stolen generations. There, the thing that I take from my interaction with Stolen Generations is strength, courage and tenacity and their determination to survive and we should all use that to inspire us um, and, and take that forward into our work um, in whatever, whatever we're doing. But I think, uh, you know, I, I have to remain optimistic um, that we can get some, um, some gains but uh, we, we're operating in a system that doesn't support um, Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander self-determination. Um, it doesn't support or acknowledge, um, you know, the the strength of culture and our spirituality, and what that means for us, and how that that helps to heal and and change lives. So we have many many challenges. Um, and I guess just one more thing is we have a very young population is 53 percent of Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people are under the age of 25 so I think that's a strength and, a, a, and an asset to us that we have a lot of youth and a lot of energy and we need to invest in that that going forward. So. Great. Um, Mick you talk about the um, reflection about the lack of implementation of the report but the report really changed the landscape and the dialogue when you look back over those 20 years, how do you describe the major impacts the report had? Um, 
Well, I think um, it certainly raised awareness um, and uncovered it. Perhaps uncovered is the wrong word. Um, but demonstrated that this ugly part of our history. Um, and presented a formula to help address it. I mean, I, I'm not... Um, things are never going to be perfect. <laughs> um, and we certainly have to... We have an obligation to keep kids safe from danger. Um, and sometimes that may need, mean um, kids um, are removed temporarily uh, from family and community. Um, but it should never be seen as a permanent thing. And we, you know, we, we try and implement um, you know, the child, Indigenous Child Placement Principle. Now, there are two jurisdictions that have removed that from a statutory, you know, no longer a statutory requirement. There's still a policy uh, approach, but um, I don't know why they've done that. Um, did it get caught up with other amendments or what have you? Um, I've said before, you know, that we could fill a couple of small suburban libraries with the reports, the evaluations, the um, Royal Commissions, the boards of inquiries, the, uh, the government assessment processes, the PhDs, <laughs> about what to do. I mean, the solution is contained in these reports and what have you. Um, but they sit on shelves and gather dust. Um, politics intervenes to thwart the best intentions of, of um, the Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people, if you like. Um, because most of these formula for the way forward through these reports uh, are arrived at through recommendations that are fully informed, uh, in most cases, by the people who um, endure the difficulties, the challenges. Uh, and they're, they're probably best placed to, to formulate the, the solutions, the answers to these problems. But those solutions and answers sit on those shelves and the people in power go merrily about their way, um, having put out what could be another in political inconvenience or a political um, bushfire, and, and, and the issue gets forgotten until um, we have an anniversary conference like this or we have annual conferences when it, it gets passing attention, uh, particularly in the mainstream media and, you know, we, we come every year and um, sit in pain and suffer and um, hope that things will be different. Um, I think they are getting different, but it's too damn slow, you know. Mm. Um, and I don't want to see the figures going up as they are when they should be going down. Jim, you made the observation before that while, as Nick says, it's often an anniversary that brings to light um, a remembrance of the bringing them home report, there are people who are living with this experience every day still. One of the key recommendations within the report was about the recording of oral histories and really being able to keep this as an important part of our history and our living history. Um, you talk about the fact that there's not enough being done for members of the Stolen Generations. What would you like to see happen to honour those stories to collect them more than is being done now? Well, I think there are better resources. Um, 
unfortunately we don't really have um gotta be careful how i say this the, the leadership for me is an issue we don't have a national body as such that concentrates on stolen generation issues uh, national sorry day committee is no longer in operation uh, from what i understand the national stolen generations alliance was defunded this year in june and to me there's not enough leadership but it's those recommendations um could make an impact and uh, i'm sorry i'm going to stray away from the question because i think um a lot of our people don't have faith in in the review and probably more so our people have a bit more faith in the royal commission into child sex abuse i gave evidence a couple of years ago and 28 percent of the victims at that point were aboriginal and i'm thinking to myself well why do our people want to go yet to another commission when the first one did nothing i understand now at the mo at the moment it's 12 percent of the victims are aboriginal so they're seeing faith in a in a commission that was purely set up i thought for whitefellas and that was my criticism of the, the terms of reference so to me there's probably going to be more faith from our point of view and from our people in the royal commission and what that might bring as far as redress as far as um, recording of oral histories uh, whilst there ha was a, a move to look at oral histories at one point i don't believe we have the resources now to ensure that happens before our before we lose our old people and I think that needs to be done more. And I think there's a lot of capacity within our, within our, within our media organisations, but um, I don't believe that's that's being uh, dealt with the way it, way it should be. So a lot more c should be done of, of our survivors. Richard, the, one of the key recommendations of the Bringing Them Home report, of course, was the focus on the principle of self-determination as a framework going forward. How important is that approach to the Indigenous community controlled sector? Can you talk a bit about what you think that means in practice now? Um, look, in my experience, I've worked in regional New South Wales. I've, I've worked out in far west New South Wales for 13 years. I've done seven years with the, the Healing Foundation. Um, and look, what I see that works are solutions that are designed and developed uh, and delivered by communities, um, by Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people themselves, and um, and that's without exception. That's the uh, that's where I think the the strengths lie. Um, my experience is that our people know know what needs to be done. Um, they don't always have we don't always have the technical expertise to do it, but there's there's ways that we can work together with communities and. I've been really pleased that the Healing Foundation has been able to do that, to, you know, work on these co-design processes that privilege Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander knowledge um, and, and provide technical support to help communities develop, um, um, you know, a plan for what they want to do, set um, the parameters of the plan, their measures of success and what they're trying to achieve. And those things are showing results for us from the work that we've done. But um, I think, as has already been commented, you know, it, it's not broad enough yet. Um, and we don't have a system that actually captures um, work, things that work. You know, we're told we need to be evidence-based and we need to, to um, you know, do the things that work. And I think, by and large, Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people do that. I think that's the basis of 65,000 years of living culture. Um, you do things that work and help you survive. Um, but we don't have systems that pick that good work up um, and then scale it up and take it more broadly. We don't have that system as yet. So what we, what we do get is we get pockets of, of good practice, good outcomes, and we get them either locally or we get them regionally, but we don't have a national approach yet. Um, and I think that you know we have you know we have many pe all the people in this room are working within a framework it's a western framework and they're working in systems that don't privilege aboriginal and torres strait islander knowledge generally um and we have a we, we've talked about the child protection system and that's a system in australia that's broken um you know if we want to see look at something from government that doesn't work and there's strong evidence that it's not working for our people um 
that's the system. Um, it's punitive. Um, it's based on a very simple process of report, substantiate, remove. Um, it doesn't provide any or minimal, it provides minimal scope for families um, to be reunited or families, to, vulnerable families to be supported. Um, and we don't understand how families become vulnerable. We haven't made the link between the stolen generation story and what's going on in our communities today. I don't think we've made that, or well, the system hasn't made that link. So, you know, we're working with a system that's broken and, and I think our people who work in those systems, you know, the work they do is admirable um, because often those systems are unsafe, um, culturally unsafe, and how people look after themselves, um, you know, I, I just uh, I, I just marvel at it. I think, um, um, you know, people working in those Western systems are amazing. I've had the had the good fortune to be working in community controlled organisations for the last twenty years, and and I know how hard that is. Um, so, yeah, I think we have um, we have some structural issues, systems issues that need to be addressed. Um, Professor Dodson, you, you made the observation about how many reports, how many recommendations sit on the shelf. Um, 20 years since bringing them home, within the last 10 years there have been 30 inquiries, there's been a Royal Commission examining the child protection systems in the Northern Territory. We had re reviews in 2007, 2010 and now another Royal Commission. There's obviously, as you say, a barrier to implementation, but you've worked in a lot of other areas other than this, especially as a social justice commissioner, you've worked to try and move governments. In your experience, what are some of the strategies we can use to try and get some shift in that, to get some take up of the agenda being put forward by the Indigenous community? Uh, in, in your question, just gone with uh, Richard, you mentioned self-determination. Um, that, that is a public policy that's never been tried in Australia. Um, and, and it's essentially, a, 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 in practical day-to-day -day terms, um, it's about people collectively making the decisions about the things that make, uh, that affect their daily lives. So they're in charge of making those decisions. And sometimes they're gonna make the wrong decision, but self-determination allows you to do that um, because you learn from wrong decisions. But hopefully you're generally making good and right decisions, but the decision making is in your hands not with some bureaucrat in a capital city or some politician who wants to come and save you. Um, the decision-making power is with you and your family, your group, your mob. Um, that's probably an oversimplification of, of the right to self-determination. Um, but I think that best explains it. And, it. and for people who think it's about breaking up the nation state and going to war and um, seizing power um, by might, uh, that's not the way I see it in practical uh, terms and political reality. Um, what we've got to strive for is to take charge of the take power um, over those decisions. We should be making these decisions, uh, not some politician, as I say, not some bureaucrat. Their job, the job of the politicians and the bureaucrats is to empower us to do that, to facilitate our decision making about what we think uh, is the right way to go, not about what they think, not their vision of where we sit, but our vision and what we think and how we go about um, fixing the problems that we, we suffer. They're not suffering these problems. 
they're our problems. And I'm, I firmly believe um, we know what to do about them if we're only allowed to do so. And get out of the road, but help us do that. You know? For example, you know, have a policy framework that allows us to do that. Have a statutory framework that allows us to do that. Have some vision about these things um, and let us get on with the job. And let us fail from time to time. Let us fall over. But I'll tell you what, we're going to get up again whenever we fall down because that's been the history of you know, 200 plus years of colonisation. It's been about our people getting up. And we're here today because of those of our folks in the, you know, who passed who kept getting up and giving us the inspiration to grasp it. We've got to, we've got to um, take hold of it. You know? um, and you know, why should some bureaucrat decide how I'm going to live, or where I'm going to live, or how I want my kids educated, or whether I want them to be imbued in, in their culture that's thousands of years old, whether they uh, have an opportunity to learn their language, they've got an opportunity to go through ceremony, they've, you know, they've got all these things. Um, and they're still, you know, productive members of the community and country, you know. Um, so it's not about separatism, it's actually about unity if you look at it. Um, and, and societies that have this diversity are are strong societies. It doesn't weaken society. It makes us stronger, actually, if we respect everybody's um, right to decide what happens in their lives and making those decisions themselves. And in a self-determination sense, it's making those decisions in, in a um, collective manner. And, you know, this is one of the hearts of... Uh, Treaty making. There will be a treaty. It's going to take some time, but it's coming, I'm sure. Can both Richard and Mick talk about self determination in its practical sense? It's something that I think we all as Indigenous people hold close to our heart as a fundamental principle. How would you see it working out in practice when you think of it in its practical form? What does self determination look like for? members of the Stolen Generation? Well, I mentioned the survivors don't have a voice and I draw on the experience where um, an AMS was successful in acquiring funds from the Healing Foundation to look at healing centre business plans and they returned the money. I'm aware that AMSs have uh, bringing them home counsellors that are transport workers and not used effectively in that role. So to me, unless until such time as the ACOs or community control organisations cease becoming black bureaucrats and working for community and for the rights of stolen generation peoples, we're going to have this problem. We don't need white bureaucrats, we've got black bureaucrats who run our services that aren't doing that effectively for stolen generation peoples. I'm aware of AMSs that have squandered money that should have gone to stolen generation groups and haven't considered working with that target group to look at their needs. And I've seen this time and time again. So if we're looking at self-determination, we need to get real with our Aboriginal services as well and not get caught up with what we're funded for. Sure, that's an obligation that we have to perform the way we're funded but we need to work in a wraparound approach and we need to work with other services. We need to work with the care bears. We need to work with these agencies. I mean, we're, what, 3% of the population. If we're going to be moving forward, we need to be working with the 97% and educating them into what our concerns are and, and work with them in a reconciliation um, framework. Um, you know, it's, I, I will always say that reconciliation will not work unless we have truth, justice and healing. So we've got to establish an, our agencies that are able to work more effectively with each other and a joined up approach because there's too many silos. And I think our services have fallen into that trap.
Richard, in 1997, at the time of the Bringing Them Home report, 20% um, of all children in out-of-home care were Indigenous. In 2017, our children represent over 36%. This is the increase in figures that people are worried about. Um, the Family Matters campaign have forecasted that if these conditions continue, um, the population of Aboriginal and um, Torres Strait Islander um, children in out-of-home care will reach that of the um, period of the formal policy. Um, in your opinion, what are the policy barriers in the area that you're working in um, that need to significantly shift um, to change this, this figure, this tide? Um, that's a good question. I, I, I think we... I guess what we're, we, we seem to... Um, the point we get to is we... We, you know, Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people are doing as much as they can within a given system to address many of the challenges we face, including um, over-representation of kids in out-of-home care. So, um, you know, I, I, and I think that that figure you've quoted, I think is probably a national figure, but if you go down, drill down to jurisdictions, it's a lot higher in some places. You know, it's getting up around 50%. Um, and that's, we should be really alarmed about that. Um, so I think one of the barriers is that we rely on government to allow us to do the things we need to do. And that's, um, and, and I think that that's what, what Mick was just talking about around self-determination and that at the end of the day, we can do as much as we can within our sphere of influence, but we're operating within a Western, West, basically a Western system um, that doesn't um, privilege our, our knowledge and our culture and, and all of those things. Um, so the, I think the barrier to us going forward is that we have to forge a different relationship with, you know, wh whether it's government or Australian people. Um, and I think that that's what the Uluru Statement, that kind of dialogue has, is starting to point us toward. Mick, Mick talked about treaty, he raised the T word. Um, and I think that that's probably the journey we're on, is getting to that point somewhere in the future because we know we can, you know, it's like we take a few steps forward then we take a couple of steps back in, in um, addressing many of the issues that we face. and the. The key challenges I see for us is our over-representation in systems like child protection, um, justice systems, and we have this burgeoning um, issue around suicide in a number of parts of our, our communities. Um, so, uh, you know, I think we have to have, and we have to, I don't know how we do it, but we've got to start with the Uluru Statement, but I think we have to think collectively as Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people about the strategies we're going to implement to move us um, to a place where we have more control over our destinies. And at the moment, unfortunately, we don't, we don't have that because we're, we're operating within a system that doesn't, um, you know, give us the full respect and, uh, um, that, we, w that we need to take, take our, our communities and our future forward. So. Um, but it just in terms of child protection, I think, you know, we have, uh, you know, there's, w what we're asking, we're asking a system that's broken to fix itself. And I just don't see that that, that will work because the legislation around child protection is really about, um, it's, it's a punitive approach. What we would call for in our communities, I think, is approaches that, su that understand the impact of stolen generations understand the impact of trauma and intergenerational trauma and how that's affecting communities, how it's affecting families and how it's affecting individuals. And that our people, we're not mad, bad, mad or bad. We, we're actually affected by trauma and that causes problems in the way we interact in our relationships. But if we get, um, if we have wraparound approaches, services and other, and healing, um, access to healing, then we can support families that are vulnerable and help them get through difficult periods so that children can stay in their families. Kids do best 
in their families, in their culture. Um, but too many of our kids are just being are drifting out and they, it's very difficult to get them back, back to family. So, you know, I think the, um, you know, what we get to is a point where we, where, as Mick said, we, we, we rely on politicians and bureaucrats to allow us um, to do things. And um, unfortunately, that's how the system works at the moment. But it's not going to, unless we change that relationship and we have more control, then we won't get, um, I don't think we will achieve as much as we, we should be able to for our people. Mick, you did mention the T word. You've um, been obviously thinking about a treaty in many forms over many years. What's your thinking now in terms of what that kind of agreement making might mean for our Indigenous communities, especially in these very practical matters like child welfare, being able to have a greater control over decisions around those sorts of things? Um, I, my starting point is um, unfinished business. Uh, that includes the colonisation of the country. Uh, the invasion and colonisation of the country, to be accurate historically. Um, you know, I don't have any um, truck with the Uluru Statement, uh, but I do have concerns about the Referendum Council's report because the immediate legal problem we have with the treaty is a racist constitution. Um, the referendum report doesn't talk about that. Uh, and I, I think in some ways they've got things back the front. Um, let's have a, a voice or a body. I'm not opposed to that. No, believe me, I'm not. Um, that formulates a constitutional change question uh, that establishes a body, blah, blah, blah. Um, I think we say fix the constitution. Then um, we ha have a treaty, ma treaty making process that deals with the unfinished business. Um, including establishing a permanent body under the treaty that is a national representative body for us. And the treaty can take a lot of legal forms, as you'd know <laughs> as a lawyer. Um, but it has to have some constitutional protection so that it can't be pushed aside if it gets politically inconvenient. Um, now, what happened here is that a, a foreign nation invaded a country t over 200 years ago uh, that without the consent of the people concerned, the people who already own as and occupies of the country, uh, they wreaked devastation the invaders wreaked devastation. Um, they destroyed culture, they destroyed language, they took land, they destroyed culture, they took children. N that, that was wrong. <laughs> Both legally and morally wrong. Um, and there's been really nothing done to address that problem. And it'll be a constant source of shame to this country if we do nothing about that. Um, and the way we deal with that is through a treaty making process. And we line up all the things we want fixed. Uh, perhaps at the national level there's a framework that includes uh, a promise that the stolen generation will never be repeated. And one of the things I mentioned yesterday, part of, part of the response to gross violations of human rights 
is a promise it's not going to happen again. <laughs> you know, they haven't given us a promise it's not going to happen again. In fact, it's, it's, it's continuing with, with great vigour. I saw figures yesterday suggesting that in, in um, the ACT, the, the number of out-of-home cares have risen in the last 10 years by 30%. That's half the time since the, since the um, Bring Them Home report. And that's 30% across the board for kids, not just Indigenous kids, but I, I bet you that um, many of that 30% increase are Indigenous kids in this town. Um, so we're going backwards in a sense. But I see a treaty process that picks up all of these things at a national level and enables people state by state, territory by territory, or even regionally, to enter sub-treaties, if you like. I'm very interested and concerned at the same time about what's happening in Victoria and South Australia, you know, because I'm, I'm feared without a national standard that we mightn't get, we might set the bar too low in, in treaty making, and, and it makes it politically more difficult for us to get a higher standard or set a high standard at a national level. So I just see the constitutional, um, fix the constitution, which includes, um, but provides an opportunity uh, to compel the federal government to enter a treaty process. Um, and nothing is off the table. Unlike the, you know, unlike the, negotiations over the Native Title Act with Paul Keating. I mean, he came into the cabinet room where we met and said this, this and this is off the table. And he uh, was able to do that because they wield the power <laughs> and we had to cop it. Um, so, you know, we need to come with the, with the clean sheet, uh, no preconditions. I mean, we still get preconditions. You know, people who, who are involved in native title settlements. I mean, the state governments come in, the first thing they demand you do is have your native title extinguished before they'll sit down and talk to you. And we don't want that sort of approach. We won't, don't want that dishonesty, that meanness. Um, that hands be tied behind the back approach um, to the fight. <laughs> um, we, we want them to come with a good heart and um, pay respect to us and treat us and treat with us um, in a fair and reasonable way. Jim, Nick talks about treaty constitutional reform. Um, Australians often look at Kevin Rudd's apology is an important national moment. And obviously we often hear Deb Swan from Grandmothers Against Removal said yesterday, sorry means you don't do it again. What's your view in terms of how important the symbolism is that can get the attention of the broader Australian community? And how do you see that against the other things that Mick, Mick is talking about, those substantial things like treaty and constitutional change? Whilst I firmly believe in the, in the treaty and uh, how that pans out, uh, it, it does concern me of how we tackle the issues at a national level. Um, the McDodsons of the world aren't always around and the leadership that has been strong, I, I, I don't think can be maintained if we don't have the resources. So I'm critical of the leadership in certain areas and. Uh, if the treaty was to enable us to look at individual states and or regions, I think, and certain regions are undertaking those sorts of approaches, I think we could move forward a lot better. I think there's some serious issues that we haven't addressed in all of this discussion and that's around social re reinvestment or justice reinvestment and that can be put into place at a regional level and certain areas of trial that in, in Australia. I think we need to do more of that given the costs of incarceration and, and by the way, 54% of the kids in care in WA are Aboriginal. 
So I think if that treaty was t and to enable us to look at frameworks in regions and or states, um, that that would be useful, but I sh it shouldn't stop the regions and states by looking at their own frameworks and treaties. Could I just have a follow-up on that? Uh, Jim mentioned um, social justice. Uh, one of the things that ought to be dusted off in a treaty process is the social justice package we put to Paul Keating that was never ever implemented. It's another one of those things that's gathering dust on some shelf somewhere, but that should for, form part and parcel of, of the treaty making process. Mm. What about you, Richard? What do you think in terms of frameworks going forward, treaty, constitutional recognition, justice reinvestment? If you had three minutes with Malcolm Turnbull, what would you say <laughs> were the biggest priorities? And we're not going to make you walk the country like Clinton Pryor we did to have an audience with him. Um, look, I, I, um, I, I'd encourage Malcolm um, to um, keep the conversation going around recognition and um, and this march towards treaty, some kind of differing relationship with Aboriginal, you know, a different resetting, if you like, uh, whatever we want to call it. But it needs, we need to be enabled and empowered a, a, to have control over our lives and our destiny. That should be the goal. Um, I, I think we, we can be accountable for that. Um, you know, the, the idea that we just, um, you know, that we exercise rights, but we exercise them responsibly. I think that's a big part of the way Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people operate. Um, yeah, but three minutes with Mel, I reckon he'd take <laughs> up two and a half minutes of those three <laughs> Just saying g'day. Um, but look, I, I just, just encourage the, you know, the dialogue to keep going um, and, uh, you know, to, to really try and... Um, get that kind of leadership engaged is, is hard but um, I think in terms of a yeah, framework for going forward we, we, we need to have um, ha we need to be at the table and we need to have the ability to influence and we need to be able to have our culture and our spiritual um, well-being recognised as being important to us well, I'm just going to open the uh, floor for questions now for our panellists have covered a range of issues. I understand there are some roving mics, so if you've got a question for uh, Mick Dodson, Jim Morrison or Richard Weston, um, now's the time. Thank you. Um, this is probably not a question. It's probably just to talk and add, a, you know, what's been said. Um, I was supposed to be up there, but I just didn't get up there. So I know everyone wanted a woman up there, but <laughs> besides um, you, Marissa. But um, look, <laughs> look. Um, yeah. Mine, as I said, is not a question, but I just want to turn back the clock. If everyone remembered, 20 years ago, we turned our back on Howard when he released this um, document, bringing them home, because we didn't believe they were going to do it. We didn't have confidence in government. And for 20 years, we've been fighting for our self-determination for our children, and we still can't get there. Why can't we get there? Until government values and respects us as the leaders of our issues and our cause, we will never get anywhere. Until that, what was said here from the panel, until we shift the power, we're not going to move. 
We're not going to move. We're in crisis at the moment. I think it was up to, we're leading up to 35% of our children coming in care. And if we don't get that, and tonight, when we all go to bed, there's about 15,000 of our children sleeping in out-of-home care. What are we going to do about it? We talk about self-determination. We need to test that. We need to really strongly fight for what that means. Because for me, it means I want to take control of my life, my communities, families. I want to be um, the strength, like every other Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander person. So I think, you know, all the good things that are going on, we're still not there because government won't shift that power and let us self-determine where we go with our families to prevent that increase of kids in care. We could make a difference. We can. I have seen some really fantastic, um, you know, pocket programs. Palm Island is one. We don't think we've removed the child... Well, not we, me, not me, I don't do it. But government has not removed children there for near five years. We are making a difference, pockets, but we're fighting to do that. But we need to collectively come together, draw in all the things that are going on at the moment, the treaty, the, you know, self term all that. We all need to bring it together and make a proper decision how we're going to protect our children from getting into the welfare system. Yeah. Are there more comments like that? Because I think we're geared up for them. Hello, my name's Bonnie. I'm a Mullinjali woman from Queensland. I work for child safety. I've been working for child safety for five years. And one of you said um, that it's a real challenge for us to be there. Oh, I fight every day in that system to make changes for our families. I fight the staff, I fight the system. I'm burnt out many a times, but I stay in there. I also fight my own family for being in there and working as a government worker. So how, or do you have any advice for someone like me, 44 years old, my father impacted by stolen generation, um, myself, I feel that also impacted by stolen generation, but have to keep that quiet. Having a white mother, um, has been also a big challenge for me in my own community. So um, how do we stay strong to fight that fight? Um, and how do we, I have seen amazing change in the last five years in child safety, they're starting to listen. But how do we stay strong as Aboriginal people, Aboriginal women especially? There's four of us in my whole um, type area um, and we have to work 20 times harder than any of my non-Indigenous colleagues um, to prove that we want to make change. So I'd be really open to any suggestions to keep me strong to stay in this environment because a lot of the time I want to leave and go back to NGO sector and work with my brothers and sisters who will support me and carry me through this journey. So you're looking at me, Richard. Uh, um, look, the sad reality, and I think it was Gary Foley who said once that if every black fella in this country dropped dead, there'd be two million unemployed white fellas. <laughs> now that's... I mean, to me, that's, that's what's going on. The industry has to be maintained. I worked in the, in the justice system and said to... Uh, a senior bureaucrat there, why aren't we looking at justice reinvestment? Well, the response was we've got to maintain the status quo. I mean, this is evil. It's evilness in our world, isn't it? Where the, the economy's got to be maintained because at our expense. You know, white Australia's privileged at our expense. So I can't answer that, sister, but that's the system where we've, we've got and, and I suppose in looking forward for me, we need to work with the 97%. We need their support. They might lose a job, but we need their support in working to, 
to reduce this level of disadvantage. We need the 97%. Our 3% aren't going to win the votes. Yeah, I, I'd just add to that. Um, just thank you for the work that you're doing, firstly. Um, and it, just in terms of what the Healing Foundation's been trying to do with a number of organisations around the nation is to um, work on a model for creating a um, healing-informed, trauma-aware working environment. So that, where that actually recognises um, uh, that people are working in really tricky situations with complex issues and the impact that has on their own well-being. Um, so there are, there are some emerging models for that. Now, I don't know if that would translate into the mainstream, um, but I would certainly encourage you, and I suspect you're doing it, is to implement your own strategies for, um, for care, keeping strong, connecting yourself to your network, um, uh, your, you know, your, your cultural networks, um, and, you know, just, and also just do whatever you can that's going to keep you in that system and keep working for our children because, um, you know, we need you there. So. Got time for another question? Uh, look, I look around and I see we've got humongous amounts of Aboriginal organisations all around Australia on the highlands. And uh, I don't know what to do, but and the towns I live, live in now and, and back then, I see our kids running around and families looking for a house, a, ho a home, for food. Now, uh, just quickly, I grew up, well, I had contact at Mungandai. I come to Moy with my mother on the train in class to take to a doctor. And when Stanley Village was born, I was on the riverbank when government agencies came down there and walked around and said, how many in your family, how many in your family? There were 29 homes. And they were just given a ticket. But they had no idea how to live in the house. I don't know if any people know of this. Or, but they just used the stoves to keep warm. They had a house, but they didn't know how to look after it. Now, we've got multiple money in agencies. What are we doing wrong as well? I mean, back to the grassroots. I mean, I walk around and I take kids home for a feed or bring them a feed in the park. And that's still doing now. I mean, if we bring our kids home, what are we bringing them home to? Are their parents in jail, most likely? I mean, I just don't know. That's a question, but it's what I see going around. Um, you know, I just had a birthday. I don't want a happy birthday, but in my short life, in, in my short life, a lot of people don't know that back then kids were still take, being taken. At 10, we used to take babies at Mungandai when the scrub was on. We used to take babies with us when an old lady told us that the welfare and the police and, uh, was coming into town. And we used to cross through scrub with one-day-old babies and stay there for a week. We used to go up behind the tip because we knew we could get a bit of food there and live near the riverbank. But I just don't know what's, what's happening. I mean, it's 2017 and I see a lot of homeless uh, Aboriginal people, um, and our young people. So I just don't know what, what we can do from here, but we've got to start doing something soon, otherwise, you know, bringing our kids home, what are we bringing them home to? I mean, young people, are, I see them. I worked in docks. I worked as a juvenile justice officer. I see young kids going down to the police station come in winter are breaking the police car with a stone. So we've got to go in for the winter, we need a home. So we've got to try and change direction somehow. You know, people, are, people don't know how to budget, so they're poor, they've got six kids. Just, that's just my question and observations. And my name's Rosemary Curtis.
Larissa, I think we've got time for two more questions. Oh, if okay. we could uh, well, think, just have one I up think there. Professor Dodson's oh. got an answer okay. to or a, a I, I don't know if we've got an answer, but happy birthday, Rosemary. <laughs> <laughs> Um, you know, uh, yeah, my ears are 68 years old, I didn't hear a word of that. <laughs> <laughs> um, Jim mentioned justice for investment. And you raise a really important issue. Um, and I mentioned earlier, we've, we've got to remove kids from danger. If, if there's a threat to their well-being, um, society really has an obligation to do something about that. But what, that's all we do. <laughs> Take the kids away from the danger and don't deal with the danger. Um, Jim mentioned justice for investment. Now in New South Wales, and I know this because I've just been part of a research project looking at justice for investment. In New South Wales, to keep one child in detention for a year costs $450,000. That's what it costs the taxpayers. To keep an adult in prison, it's been to between two hundred and fifty and two hundred and eighty thousand dollars a year. The idea of justice reinvestment is to not spend that money on corrections or detention. Obviously, there's some evil people you got to lock up for a long time. I'm not talking about them. Um, and you know, there's 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 kids that. Um, um, are troubled and need to be in some sort of protective care. Um, but the overwhelming majority are there because of no reason uh, of their, you know, for no fault of their own. Um, they're there because, and primarily because they come from really um, challenging circumstances. Uh, there is problem at home. So we take the kids out, we spend a lot of money on them. Um, Justice for Investment says, why spend that money there? All of that money there, why not look at something else? Can we do something to f help the family with that money? You know, what if the $450,000 went to the family? I'm sure they'd fix the problem. <laughs> you know, you could work out a way of doing that. But justice, justice reinvestment doesn't say that. It doesn't say, oh, t turn it into the family. It says turn it into the community and the family. So we fix a lot of things. You know. the, the justice reinvestment project I was involved in is out at Cowra, <coughs> which is a large Aboriginal population. It's pretty low level in terms of offending. Um, but, you know, a disproportionate number of Aboriginal kids going into youth dissension and into um, out-of-home out of home care. And the, and the community took charge of the project, and it's now being piloted, where they said, look, this is how much... Over a, over, we looked at a 25-year period. Over those 25 years, for kids in detention, there's something like... For, and for low-level cr crime, there was, um, you know, it cost the town in monetary terms something like $28 million over 10 years. So we say to them, here's 28 million, how would you like to spend it? And they said, well, we want after school care, we want home care, we want uh, proper housing for, for troubled kids, we want all these other supports that have all been taken out of care and move to Dubbo. We want those, we don't have a youth worker in town. You know, we want a half a dozen youth workers. So you, you spend that money dealing with the problem, not taking the kid out of the problem. You know, come back and fix the problem. 
Um, and that's the sorts of things I think we ought to be agitating for because it's really stupid to spend money to lock someone up for a year then it's going to cost you as a taxpayer $450,000. I'm sure we can spend that money better. I want to make a quick comment and, and um, honour the Healing Foundation. I don't know if you know the work that they did in collaboration with Deloitte's where it talked about half a million dollars it costs for Indigenous incarceration with um, anticipated recidivism. The same report talked about the budget for a healing centre in 2014 was $464,000 a year. So it's a no-brainer. And we've got to look at the justice reinvestment. There's two kids in care in Western Australia that's costing taxpayers a million dollars each. Three siblings in Western Australia that's costing taxpayers half a million dollars. When I gave evidence to the Royal Commission, I said, give us back our missions. We'll take care of our kids. We won't need government or pedophilia. We'll do it our way. And Roland's mission is doing that. Congratulations. Where's my brother there? They're taking on a foster child right now. Now, Rochelle, are you telling me one more question? My eyes are as bad as Mick's ears. <laughs> I'm, okay. I've been asked to keep it quick, so I will. Um, just want to ask, when we talk about treaty and leadership, how do we adequately pick that leadership that's going to ensure that we're all represented? So when I look at the panel, we say 53% of our youth are under 25, but we're not represented up on the panel. When we talk about... 25. Uh, <laughs> when we talk about, um, for me, old ways, men and women and youth would sit together and make decisions together. So how do we ensure that when we start to choose our leadership, that I, as someone coming from a youth background, um, is adequately represented? They're letting me go first because I'm closer to your age group. <laughs> um, look, I, I think the answer, f the answer I what I would say to you um, is don't wait for permission, all right? 53% of the Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander population, as you said, under 25, demand your seat at the table. Um, uh, and I know, I know we, we get into all sorts of issues around respect and for our elders and et cetera, but we have to have respect for our young people as well. Um, you guys, it doesn't matter what we do and say in the next um, period of our careers or lives, it's you're the guys that are gonna be living with it. So just start to demand a seat at the table. Yeah, come on. <laughs> There's another question. Again, I've been told to make it quick, so I'll speak really quickly. Um, Jim, I want to congratulate you for being so strong on your views around the divide and conquer with our CEOs of ACOs um, and Aboriginal people in those positions. You know, and that's exactly what the white fella does really well is divide and conquer and, and I think when we become united as black people across this country we'll truly have a real voice and take back control. I disagree with the treaty. New Zealand and Native America have got treaties and very little has changed. I firmly believe we need to move away from the monarchy and the Commonwealth and go to a federation and change that racist constitution and I think that's the start, then we can start to look at women, youth, elders and all those other people to, to sit on that. And I think I, I was in that leadership forum in Adelaide when they looked at what was going to replace ATSIC for the voice of our people. That brought in the neoliberalism across this country which took away that self-determination and, emp and empowerment for our people and I think we need to take that back. But <laughs> um, Mick, as a social justice commissioner, you're the only one that I've ever seen do anything in that position and I congratulate you on that. And I've done nothing but admire you in the work that you've done. What I hope when we look at the survivors, the perpetrators now of sexual abuse who were once 
in the system. When I look at our young people now, the onslaught 54 in WA, and I'm hoping that when you talk about the social justice policy that you gave to Paul Keating, part of that is around compensation for all of those victims, survivors, perpetrators, because um, what I would hope when we look at what's happened with the refugee detainees that got paid $70 million for racial discrimination, I think that's where we need to go and we need to hit the Australian government and our state governments really hard so that we a they actually start to look at systemic change and make a difference for our people. Thank you very much um, for your comments. Um, look, folks, we're, we're not all going to be agreed on this. We're, we're going to have our differences. We're, we have different views. Um, I, I at one time thought the idea of a treaty was crazy. You know, but I don't think that anymore because others have persuaded me that um, that's a way forward if we can persuade um, those who have colonised us to come to the table. Uh, and I would see that happening through a treaty commission. And I would insist that that treaty commission is representative of all our peoples, uh, men, women, elders, disabled, youth, um, etc., gay and lesbian people. You know, uh, I think um, it won't work unless it's an inclusive treaty, and we have a say on its membership. Uh, inclusive treaty commission um, that we have not just a say on its membership but the say on its terms of reference. Okay. Well, that's a great point on which to um, finish up the session. Um, I was going to ask each of you if you had a final comment, if you just had a reflection after, the, after what's been raised by the floor. Look, look I know we... Um we have to challenge that the bringing them home report recommendations be implemented. But I think we need to be strategic and we now know that a place called New Norcia Mission in Western Australia was the worst place for pedophilia. We now need to look closely at recommendation 41 that talks about church groups assessing their land to hand back to us to create cultural healing centres. They were granted land to take our children away. And they made a lot of money out of this. So we need to be strategic in some of these recommendations. It's fine to say, yes, it's 20 years on and four or five have been implemented, but let's be strategic too and, and think about the victims that have gone before the Royal Commission and look at some sort of redress before they die. My, my last final comment was a question of compensation. I mean, that's a part of the unfinished business. It certainly was a recommendation of the bringing them home uh, inquiry report. Uh, it's part of the package for a response to uh, gross violations of human rights. Um, I think I'd just start where we or finish where we started and just acknowledge um, stolen generations for their strength and um, courage and um, agree that um, you know reparations is still a live issue we found we found that in our own work with stolen generations reparations um, understanding the current needs of the stolen generations and get gaining a better understanding of intergenerational trauma and its impacts in our communities. I think it's the, um, I think it's a sleeping issue for us. I think we've talked about it, we, we mention it a lot, but we don't know enough about it and its impact. And if we can learn anything from the stolen generations experience, we can learn about trauma and how it affects people's lives physically and, and psychologically. Um, and just on um, the, the the last questioner about uh, treaty and that sort of thing. I think the um, 
what's important is is the debate, the conversation we have to have amongst ourselves. As Mick said, we won't all all agree, but let's have a let's start talking about it. this is about our future, and um, and the future of our young people. Um, so it's really important that we engage in that conversation and not just uh, dismiss it. I don't know what to say now, me. Oh, come on, big shot. <laughs> um, last comment is, number one, thank you for everything you've done to pave the way for our youth. Um, and I completely agree. I think we need to give our youth a voice, but we also, as youth, need to make sure we listen and follow the path that's been laid before us. And um, always remember what what people have done for us to actually stand here and be proud. So. I, I guess I want to thank everyone and thank you for humbly accepting me up here. I'll get off the stage now. <laughs> thank you. Larissa, can I just make one last yeah. comment, please? And I'm sorry, sure, sorry to do this. I think we all need to get our head around the, the trauma we've inherited from our grandmothers. Please get an understanding of epigenetics and how we've inherited trauma. You need to study that epigenetics and move forward with this because that's the way forward, epigenetics. And I just want to thank you all for um, f the generosity of allowing us to record this session for speaking out. And um, it's a real honour for us at the program to be able to broadcast this on Friday night on Radio National nationally so people across the country can hear these important voices and this conversation and hopefully find out more about the really amazing work that's going on in our communities by the, um, the members of... Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander communities across the country who care deeply about these issues. So I just apologise for my confusion at the beginning of the session, but I think the panellists have more than made up for it. So can you <laughs> join me in thanking Professor Mick Dodson, Jim Morrison, Richard Weston and Stuart McMinn. <laughs>